Welcome. In the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of Bethel Church, I want to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you on this Easter Sunday. It is indeed the pivotal moment of our Christian faith when we recognize and honor and pay tribute to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And I'm just so pleased that you could uh, tune in to join us on, on this special day. We're, we're glad to have you, and I hope what we do and say in the context of this 30 minutes uh, will reaffirm your faith in the God who loves us so much that he was willing to send his only son to die for us and to raise him from the grave, that we too may have life eternal. Uh, in the context of our service uh, today, we will be celebrating the uh, Sacrament of Holy Communion. And so if you haven't done so already, please do prepare uh, bread and cup beforehand. Whatever you may choose is fine, whatever you're comfortable with to serve in that capacity and preserve the uh, sanctity of this holy meal. And then when instructed to do so, you may ingest those elements. Well, having said such, let us now uh, uh, come to uh, God in prayer as we begin our time of worship together. Let's pray. Oh, well, gracious God, you do surprise us in so many ways, and this morning you surprise us most of all with the gift of your risen Son. May that understanding of, of life that overcomes the threat of death be our byword for not only this day, but for all of our days to come. And it is in the name of the risen Christ that we pray. Amen.
If there are children on this Easter day watching the worship video with you, please do ask them to put down their Easter baskets. There'll be time for candy later. Bring them on up, have them pay attention. I've got an Easter message designed especially for them. Hi, boys and girls. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. I'm so glad that we're able to be together on this special day. Hey, I wanted to ask you a, a question today. How many of you have been surprised? I don't mean just a little surprised. I mean really, really surprised, huh? Let me give you an example. Sometimes for a birthday party, we won't tell the birthday boy and girl that we're going to have a party for them. And so they may be taken downtown or someplace else with their mom. In the meantime, their dad and all their good friends are back at home getting ready, you know. Then the birthday boy or girl come back to the house. Everybody's hiding in the dark. They walk in. The light comes on. Everybody stands up and shouts, Happy Birthday! Boy, what a surprise that can be. If that hasn't happened to you, it will someday. It is a surprise. Take it from me. Or how about this? Perhaps you're at school and you think, you take a test and you think, oh, I did so poorly. I'm so sad about that test that I think I failed. And then three days later, the test comes back and you look down at it and there in blue letters is a great big A. You didn't do bad at all. You passed the test with flying colors. What a wonderful surprise, huh? Well, today, on this particular day, this Easter day, our Bible reading is about three women who got a really, really big surprise. They were dear friends of Jesus, and he had died. And they went, the three of them, to go and visit his grave, but when they got there, they discovered that his grave was empty. Jesus wasn't there, which made them surprised, but also pretty sad. And then an angel came and talked to them and told them not to be sad. They should be, and they shouldn't even be surprised because Jesus had risen from the dead just as he had told them that he would do. So remember, you guys, we worship a God of wonderful surprises. And just like he surprised those three women on that first Easter morning, he'll surprise you too, as he surprises all of us by reminding us that no matter where we go or what we do, that God loves us, each and every one of us, not only on Easter Sunday, but every day of the year. Would you pray with me, please? Well, dear God, thank you for the gift of Easter, for raising your son from the dead so that he may be with us, beside us, and a friend to us each and every day. Amen. Today's gospel comes from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement have seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Today's Easter epistle comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1a, 3 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins 
in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I. But the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so have come to believe. Let's join our hearts together as we turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we just ask that you will bless this time of reflection on this Easter day. That as we look back on this ancient story, these words that are, are so familiar to our ears can help us to see them fresh, with fresh eyes and hear them with, with fresh ears, that they may find a new application, new relevance in our modern day lives. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm here to tell you that the Buckholtz family are Harry Potter fans. Well, that's not exactly true. Two out of three residents of the parsonage next door are dedicated fans. The other, that is me, not so much. But I do enjoy Potter vicariously through the enthusiastic fandom of my wife and daughter. They've read the books, they've watched the movies, they've even made pilgrimage to Universal Studios in Orlando to experience for themselves places like Diagon Alley and the Leaky Cauldron and Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. You get the picture. Well, I must confess that I can't quote J.K. Rowling like Jenny and Izzy can, but maybe there is one exception. And that is I've always been fascinated by a particular scene out of the thousands of pages in Rowling's eight book series. If I could, I'd like to share it with you. If you simply can't stomach Harry Potter, I, I know how you feel, trust me, I know how you feel, but indulge me for a moment anyway, if you would, please. Here's the situation. We're in chapter 12 of book two, called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and, and Harry's waiting in the office of Professor Dumbledore, the dean of the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Harry's alone at first, or so he thinks, until he notices, as Rowling tells it, that standing on a golden perch behind the door is a decrepit-looking bird that resembles a half-plucked turkey. Then suddenly, we're told, right before Harry's eyes, the bird, the bird bursts into flame, gives one loud shriek, and then seconds later is nothing but a smoldering pile of ash on the floor. Well, much to Harry's surprise, when Professor Dumbledore comes in and sees what's happened, he's anything but upset. Rowling writes, Dumbledore chuckles at the stunned look on Harry's face and then explains, My bird fox is a phoenix. Phoenixes burst into flame when it's time for them to die and are reborn from the ashes. It's a, shame, it's a shame, Harry, you had to see him on a burning day. He's really very handsome most of the time, wonderful red and gold plumage. Now you understand better how I feel lots of days when I can't escape the telling and retelling of Harry Potter stories. 
But this one, this one in particular, I do believe, proves itself relevant beyond just fantasy and fun. Because I think for you and me this Easter Sunday 2021, it provides a means for us to better understand ourselves, our circumstance, and the challenges of our faith. As we're all quite aware, it's been a full year since the COVID-19 epidemic began. To say it's been hard is a bit of an understatement. We've lost time, we've lost people, we've lost community. We've watched our economy suffer and our children too. But perhaps the most notable victim in all of this is our faith. On account of COVID-19, we've met God, or so it seems, on his burning day. At least from behind our face masks, he's looking a bit decrepit. A God who just a year ago, figuratively speaking, was, was really very handsome with wonderful red and gold plumage, sovereign and powerful, protective of our collective health generous to our economy, and merciful to our church. It wasn't hard to trust in a God such as this, a, a God of blessing, a God of favor. But what about now? Where is that handsome, ever-so-capable God now? Where is God when variants of the coronavirus threaten to prolong this pandemic? Where is God when social unrest and political turmoil dominates the evening news? Where is God when our sanctuary, once filled to capacity on this most blessed day, is, is now nearly empty? On the surface, at least, it might appear that God has, in, in so many words, burst into flame to become nothing but a smoldering pile of ash. That's how the author of the first letter to the Corinthians must have felt, too. The Apostle Paul, who for most of his life went by the name Saul, was a man of deep faith. At least according to the religious protocol of his day, he was an upstanding Orthodox Jew who trusted in the God of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now there's been a change. Now there's talk of a Messiah, a man named Jesus, who was crucified under Roman law for claiming to be the Son of God. And now, even after his death, Jesus has collected quite a following. This so-called Jesus movement flies in the face of, of Jewish expectations for a promised Messiah. A Messiah that will save Israel from its oppression under the iron boot of Rome. So from a Jewish perspective, that notion of Messiah doesn't square with someone who was a victim himself and who died at the hands of his oppressors without fuss or protest. To Saul, the Christian persecutor, God in the person of Jesus Christ was no Messiah, just a decrepit bird on his burning day. That is, of course, until Saul was on his way to Damascus to squelch the rumors, rumors that this Jesus was not dead at all, but in fact alive, having risen from the grave. In this regard, Paul was a lot like you and me, especially over the course of this past 12 months. For like us, Paul was, as he says, untimely born. He wasn't around to see Jesus after his resurrection, he had no first-hand knowledge of the Easter morning experience of Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome who witnessed the empty tomb. Instead, Paul experienced the same thing that you and I are experiencing today. That is the startling realization of an inescapable truth, a notion deep within the depths of his being that the rumor is true that the phoenix has risen, that the glory and grace of Almighty God would not nor could not be contained by the confines of a rock-hewn tomb. Now, I don't know for sure if J.K. Rowling believes what the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark suggests. 
but I have a hunch that what inspired her writing about the burning day of Dumbledore's bird had to come from a place of acceptance within her soul that the rumor is true. That life, not death, has the final word. That from the ashes of destruction emerge the seeds of hope, the promise of wholeness and the reassembly of all that is perfect and sure. In our present context here today, Easter 2021 represents a post-pandemic experience. With our hearts of faith enlightened, you and I are confessing that what life can be, what life will be beyond this time of, of separation and uncertainty. We're confessing we don't have to wait for the distribution of more vaccine. We don't have to wonder about new outbreaks or economic setbacks. Because by the power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, I believe and declare that you and I this very day have walked out of the tomb of pandemic and into the light of a new dawn. If the gospel of Jesus Christ means anything, if the gospel of Jesus Christ has any relevance at all, surely it is now and it is here. It is in the eyes and hearts and each and every one of us who, who dare to confess that the rumor is true. And make no mistake, by that confession, you and I are blessed with the grace and love of a God who is alive, a God whose plumage is red and gold, bright and beautiful, adorned, as it were, in inexplicable, immutable, eternal love. A love that will prevail long after the winds of, of human ambition have ceased to blow in the pain of pandemic long forgotten. So Bethel Church, what do you say? Are you with me on this? Will you leave this time of Easter worship with a, a renewed sense of hope and purpose, thumbing our noses at COVID-19 and, and welcoming the resurrected Christ back onto the scene? I pray that it's so for me, for you, and for us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
Let's take this opportunity to offer to God our prayer of confession. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have, have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned, and crowned him Lord of all. all. We, we confess that we have not bowed before, before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. lives. We, we have, have gone, gone along with the way of the world, world and, and failed, failed to give, give him glory. glory. Forgive, Forgive us and raise us from, from sin that, that we, we may live to be, be your, your faithful, faithful people. people. And may those thoughts continue in the silence of each of our hearts. Amen. Friends, the assurance of our forgiveness rests at this sacred table. Know by what we will do and say here in the next few minutes will indeed be a testament to the love of God in your life. Let it be so. Because Jesus did say, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. And Jesus also said, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Friends, we come to this table not as perfect people. We come not because we ought, but because we may. Not because we are righteous, but because we are penitent. Not because we are strong, but because we are weak. We come to this table not because we are whole, but because we are broken. Would you join with me now in the prayer of the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give our thanks and praise to you, O God. You created the world by speaking life into being. You placed within us amazing abilities to form and nurture new life so that your creation might be renewed season by season and child by child. You covenanted with your people and you gave them law, a path of peace, justice, mercy, reverence, and love. And then you called forth prophets who dared to speak your truth to worldly powers that promoted death. And then in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, your son, to walk in the way of truth that we might follow. You sent him, your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. In Christ, you revealed your love, you radiated your life, and Jesus taught those who listened to him, and he healed those who believed in him, and he received all who sought him. He enacted peace in the midst of violence, love in the face of hate. And so it is in and through him that we thank you, God, for that incredible gift, the word made flesh, whom through his death and resurrection you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made us a new people, a people who now proclaim the mystery of our faith by saying, our Father, Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the, the glory forever. forever. Amen. And so it was on the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus sat at table with his closest friends to celebrate the Passover meal. And as they sat, he took bread and he, he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, Take and eat. 
This bread is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way also then, Jesus took a cup and having poured, he gave it to them saying, take and drink. This cup is my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of your sins. It represents a, a new covenant between God and yourselves, a covenant no longer based upon law, but rather a covenant based upon love. And then Jesus added, as often as you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And then the Apostle Paul, looking back on that even, evening, reflected by saying, as often as we eat this bread and, and drink this cup, we do indeed proclaim our Lord's death until the day of his blessed return. Friends, this is the feast of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And as we now uh, intend to ingest these sacred elements, I would ask you at home to, to gather whatever you have prepared as bread and as cup, and I will invite you uh, to consume these blessed elements. First, the bread. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And then the cup. And take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for your sins. Friends, for what we have just received, may I offer, please, a, a word of gratitude. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we do indeed thank and, and praise you for the opportunity to, to be here, to be uh, with you and with each other, if not in physical contact, certainly in spirit. And we just thank you for the sustenance of this holy meal that it will nurture and, and sustain us as we go forth from this blessed Easter day into the world where we will be, Christ's hands and feet and voice. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.
Friends, receive now these words of, of blessing and benediction on this blessed Easter day. May God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and give each and every one of you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let all of God's people at home say, Amen. Good morning. Thank you to everyone who provided the beautiful Easter lilies that adorn our church today. We'd like to wish happy birthday this week to Robert Duvall, Michelle Roberts, Stephen Ream, Barbara Bronze, Michael Keller, Kim Herter, Ryan Mann, Megan Vogel, Mackenzie Roberts, Laura Lee Barron, Hattie Carson, Ryan Amrine, Elizabeth Barron, Daryl Bauer, and Ellie Sinkowitz. If you have been moved by today's service, please consider a donation to Bethel Church. You can donate via PayPal on our website, BethelOnTheHill.org, or by mailing a check to the church. Thank you. <laughs>